Coming to you from Austin, Texas on this sunny day. It's Color Commentary, and we are Adrian Guarzales. And Michael Petchik. Um, So, we can review? Uh, yeah, we can review. Um, I did not get a chance to play FNM again. I have, uh, you know, summer graduations, all that. On Moto, I played a lot of Eldrazi again. <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah, you may have seen the, the Rebrew series featuring uh, new HJ's Delve Reanimator deck. That, yep. that went pretty well, so we're definitely going to be making more of those in the future. Yeah, I think I think we're going to try and review something on the on the podcast, and then we're going to do playthrough videos. Hopefully I'll be able to join in yes. future ones. Yes, we definitely would prefer to do them together. Yeah. Um, I also didn't actually play Popper at FNM this week because... Legacy was happening, and someone yeah, someone yeah. someone let me borrow mud, and I scrubbed out like terribly with it. But we, we like we like Legacy too, you know. Yeah, we like Eternal formats. On the bright side, I did actually get a chance to uh, sneak a peek at what people were playing. Um, someone was playing Pedal Festival. Someone there were two Rug Tron players, aka My Dream is Dead, Rip Affinity, never playing that deck again. Uh, to be fair, there was also a dude who showed up with Mono Black Land Destruction featuring Sinkhole. You know, we haven't banned that card yet, but that might be something we want to visit. I don't want to ban it out of spite in this I, case. I, uh, I actually spoke to him, and I said that next week I did want to have like a nice long discussion with him about how he felt the deck was performing. Like he did, he did automatically say, you know, this week I did run into two Rug Tron decks, so you know. Against well, Rugtron, it seems pretty sweet to have a two mana land destruction. It, it spell. does seem pretty sweet, but like, here, so here's the thing about Sinkle, right? Very good against Tron. Um, I know we're diverging a little here, but, like, is Sinkhole, like, two mana? It's a, is it an instant? It's a sorcery. Okay, so, so you have to spend your second turn. Like, what if you're playing against Delver, right? And it's like, oh, you blow up an island. Yeah. Like, how much does Delver really care about that? I, I, I think the big thing is just, like, I want to get this guy's opinion on it because he's actually played the damn thing. Yeah, yeah. And I, I just, it just doesn't seem very good to me in a lot of cases. We've had people show up with Sinkhole decks, like, there was some dude who plays Pox and Legacy who showed up with Mono black control running for sinkholes. Now, I, think, and I think that is correct. I'm not saying that's incorrect. I just don't like like because there are some cases people just blow the other person out of the water. But I just don't know if it's you know always going to be a good card. I yeah, I think that's my big thing. Like I'm not until we get like definitive results on where this you know where this card falls in the meta in terms of power level. I think. I'm going to let it ride. And, and that, that being said, I do know a lot of metas go ahead and just ban it. Right? Yes. Because, and I think that that's more because two mana land destruction is a feel bad. Yeah. I, I, I think in certain ways it is a feel bad. Um, if you're keeping a one lander and you get punished for that, you know, I don't know. I, I have a hard time feeling super bad for that, but well, I don't know. I'm also coming from the point of view where I play Affinity, right? And so, like, I have to play against Ancient Grudge and Mox Monkey. And it's yeah. like, you know, I, I know that beating all too well, but those are cards that people, you know, don't ban out of the format. Those are, like, real cards. And I mean, I, I think the bigger complaint people have about Sinkhole is the fact that it's good against any deck. Like, there's no reason not to run a main board, right? That's true, like, yeah. What, what was he cutting out of his NBC list? Oh, he wasn't running NBC. Uh, well, so there was the guy who showed up a couple months ago with NBC running it, and I forget what he had cut out of it. Um, the guy who showed up this week was actually just running Black Land Destruction with, like, I think it was, like, Gurmag Angler's Wincon. So basically just, like, Ice Quake. um, Choking Sands. Choking Sands, which I think is a dodgy main deck choice, but, you know. Well, if you play against two Revtron players, it's not. Yeah, no. I think they're, yeah, it just, that's heavily dependent on your meta. I think so. Because I would argue that if your meta is, like, Delver, yeah, it's terrible. Yeah. But it it is destroying non Swamp. Yeah. Like, I, I, I don't know. I, I think we have to see how it shakes out, see, like, if this sinkhole deck becomes so clearly dominant. Well, you said he went 2-1, right? Uh, I I think I left a little on the early side because of the uh, the rainstorm that happened. Yeah. Um, and I think he was playing in the finals if he was in the XO. It was only, like, seven people, so he would have been 2-0 at that point. And I think his final, final round opponent was playing Rugtron, which I think just probably isn't getting out from under, like, the most oppressive land no. destruction and, spell and possible. Does he, to, does he know that most people normally do ban Sinkhole? Yes. I, I I played against him a couple weeks ago when he was on Affinity, and... Oh, I, was this the blue Affinity guy? Yeah. Okay, but so so he he wouldn't take it hard if we did decide to ban it. 
Yeah, it, from from what I heard, you know, he was like, "Yeah, no, I I understand why you're you're talking to me right now about this." So I don't know. I'm not dreadful. Well, yeah, it's, it's never yeah. come up. So, and we're we're about to go over a deck that we're going to a lot of play like, Merchant Scroll. So you know, <laughs> we haven't banned, we haven't quite banned that card yet either. Yeah. So um, this week we're talking about kind of a I guess the fallout of the EMA spoilers because everyone was pumped about you know Nimble Mongoose and. All these cool reprints that we got, you know, helping out with the moto economy and all that. But Peregrine Drake. Peregrine Drake happens next week. I'm in paper. I think I'm okay with that. You know, so we're looking... We have a, we have a few lists put together here to review what, what we think might be the best Peregrine Drake combo list. And they're all okay decks. I think I know which one my favorite is. But nothing a good Hydra... Nothing a good, excuse me, Pyroblast can't stop. <laughs> Well, I think I think Pyroblast alongside like just the fact that a lot of there are a lot of fast aggro decks. Like Kelmfiend can just win on turn three. You know, and I think I would be more worried if Peregrine Drink was like a three four, and so like it couldn't get bolted. It couldn't get bolted. I think I would care a lot more then. But there's a lot of interaction with Peregrine Drake. You know, um, you if you counter, they don't get their lands back. But if you kill it once it's down, then you know before they before it's uncaptured or it, like resolves, you can maybe blink their combo. Yeah. I, 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 th- I think there's definitely like answers to this in the format, and because of that, I'm not I'm not saying it's the end of the world. Um, there were a couple people on the Popper subreddit who were like, "Look, this this is gonna bust the format wide open. Like, this is gonna be so much worse than you know fairies ever was." I just I can't agree with that because fairies came down turn two. This come, this has to wait till turn five in those cases, or at least turn four. Um, yeah. Um, the combo is slower. Um, what else am I trying I, to say? I think one of the things that did get pointed out that I think is relevant is Electricery is no longer an answer. That's true. It's Bolt. Period. Yeah. Um, um, and I, I will say that I used to bring in Relic of Progenitus to yep. attack their graveyard, and that's a viable way to disrupt the combo, too, because they're looking to loot, you know, infinite... Ghostly flickers, basically, and if you can remove them from the from the equation, they, they can't combo anymore. Yes, I, I think I think there are still good answers to this deck. I think you know having to use a bolt instead of an electricity. Like if you're running red, you're probably running some number of bolts, and and then it's like Delver seems particularly good, right? Because if you're you're a reaction reactionary deck versus a combo deck, so like the best one of the heaviest. Most plays decks in the format already seems like it has enough answers to deal with this. Yeah. Um, so let's actually get into some of the lists. So okay. the, you want to you want to kind of tackle the first list? Yeah. The first one is a list that I personally brewed, and it was sort of my take on what I thought the mono blue list might look like. So we have a uh, twenty two islands because I think a high land count is pretty good, especially since the deck is running. What's that card called? Uh, the one where you discard lands. Um, Una's Grace. No. The <laughs> oh, uh, compulsive research. Yeah, for compulsive research. Uh, so, and then I thought, you know, this is so twenty-two islands for compulsive research is obviously we want to keep that in there because that's just super good. Uh, two gushes because it's a, it's since now you're a mono blue deck, you can afford to play gush and gush is stupid good. Uh, four counter spells protect the combo. Uh, I'm only, I'm only putting one ghostly flicker and one capsize in. Capsize is the win condition, and those are the win cons. And like maybe that's not good. Maybe we should be running a little bit. Redundant on those. I, I, I think you want more flickers. I yeah. Think because sometimes you're just going to value flickers on things. In, in that case, I also have two dispels here in the main deck, which is probably incorrect. It's probably correct to run another ghostly flicker, or, or maybe two more ghostly flickers, maybe one more capsize. Because, like, capsize is not necessary to win. It just helps no. a lot. So, so, so you're also running... So you, you have two options here. You've got the capsize out, and then you've also got pulse of research. Right, so and then there's even a third thing too. Like I'm playing four of the Drakes, three Moldrift, and three Moldrifters. So the flying beats is real too. I, I I think I think you got multiple outs. I think that's good. I get. I guess my only worry about this, you know, would be proper ratios on things, and you know. Oh yeah, I just I just threw this list together as to what a mono blue list might look like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I'm, I'm not also a big fan of your uh, four preordains and four ponders main deck, but I. I just want... I think you want more dig. I think what, that's what? The These are the best dig cards in the format. What would you play? Um, I mean... I'm playing four Merchant Scroll. Yeah, I, I, I guess since, you know, we're in paper and we can play more Merchant Scroll, that doesn't actually feel that bad. But, um... 
Okay, so so with this list, you know, I think it's I think it's the simplest version possible. Yeah, it's it's just like I'm mono blue. I have dig and disruption. I'm going to try and tutor out my cap size and my flicker. And when at, at some point I'm playing defensive creatures, there's four seagate oracles and a mnemonic wall. So I'm trying to play defensively until I can get my Drake capsize lock. Okay, I, I think I think one of the other things that's interesting about this is it does show an, an upgrade in a way with the Drake in the fact that you're not running any non-basics. And you can just combo off with five basics. Yes. And and no familiars. Yes. And I think that I think that is a big deal for this deck because it does mean, you know you're not going to get as punished by, you know, the sideboard land hate that a lot of people would bring in against familiars. Because, like, getting to, like, Choking Sands, a Karoo land, was really powerful against old familiars. Mm -hmm. So I I think, you know, while it trades off diversity of spells, a mono blue list does have the advantage of being a bit more resilient. And I would say, I mean, the decks do the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, they're they're digging for their combo, and so now you don't... I mean, I think the biggest sacrifice for me and the reason why I actually don't think this is the optimal list is that it it's not playing any interactive spells, and so aggro will just run over this list, I think. Yeah, I, th- I think that's one of the... And, I mean, and in that case, maybe it's correct. Instead of 22 Islands, you know, maybe don't play Gush, play some number of Radiant Fountains, and play Pristine Talisman. Yeah, maybe, because uh, you can get either of those involved in a flicker loop once you've got infinite mana. Exactly. And, I mean, yeah, I, I could see that. And, you know, maybe you run a quicksand or two to help against the really aggressive decks because... Yeah. In, in that case, though, you wouldn't be playing Gush, probably. Yeah. Yeah, you'd probably cut the Gush. I like quicksand because um, it kills Kiln Fiend really well. Mm-hmm. And it is a non-counterable kill. It kills Calfrago, right? Yeah. Um, I, 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 think, I think what I'm much more concerned about is the uh, the Kiln Fiend, just because that can be a turn three kill. Yeah. Whereas, you know, Frogmite's rarely the straw that breaks the camel's back in Affinity. It's true. So, I I think... Yeah, yeah. It's, Quicksand is just a good card, and you know, I'm... The Delver lists aren't playing as much, but when I started playing Popper, the Delver lists all ran some number of Quicksands. Do you know why they stopped? Um... Did they go up in Gushes? I don't know. I don't play... I don't know. My, my deck plays two... I play two Gushes in my deck. Two yeah. gushes might be too much for a deck running like a couple quicksands. Yeah. I don't know. This, also, this, Nambo with Spire Golem, so. Yeah. It, this is really not my wheelhouse. Like, the Mono Blue Delver is so far from what I play most of the time, where, you know, I couldn't really give you a solid answer on that. But, yeah, I, th- I think this list kind of wants like a one or two of quicksand to help it against, you know, Delver Fiend or. Really, any other fast aggro thing, because unless you can give something hexproof or shroud, this it, it's an activated ability, so you, and we don't have a stifle effect. It's not not it's colorless, and more importantly, it's not an artifact, so you can't apostle's blessing in a way. Mm-hmm. So I think you know that that really does work well for this. Um, but okay, so we, we've got mono blue, right? Yes. Um, so the next one on our list is a return to the full Esper. Right. It's We've just looked at a list online that is the Esper combo. It just has the Drake instead of the Cloud Fairies. Yep. It, it is also it also got a Warden of Evil Style slotted into it, which I'm not sure how I feel about in this list. I don't really know either. I mean, so the list we're looking at here is playing three Nightscape Familiar, four Sunscape Familiar, normal. One Sage's Road Denizen, unless it's a list tuned for Moto. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Sage's Road Denizen takes the fewest number of clicks to win. So it's generally the favored win con on, on Midgo. Uh, four Warden of Evos Isle, which in this deck functions um, just like another familiar effect, right? It's one off all your flying creatures. And this is interesting. We, we mentioned this briefly before we started. Four Alkaeomancers and four Demonic Balls. Yeah, I think, I think that's just, you know, for redundancy's sake and, like, very much being all in on this combo. Right. Uh, we also have four Mold Drifters and four Peregrine Drakes, which is a pretty good reason to play uh, Warden of Evos Isle. So, I, you know, ideally, turn two, you're playing a Sunscape or a Nightscape Familiar, and then um, your Wardens cost less, and then you play a Warden, and then your Mold Drifters and your Drakes cost less. Yeah, and then they're running... Ooh. 
I'm not sure why they're running Cloud Shift in this list. I'm not a I'm not a big fan of Cloud Shift. Yeah, Cloud Shift is although it does loop with um Oh no, it, you need something to untap still, don't you? You you can't loop it with the Archaeomancer. Because it just flickers one thing. I think mean, yeah. I think that's wrong. But then it's running four snaps, which can help the combo along, because you can untap stuff with it. Right. And that that's very reminiscent of the older combo, where it was another effect to get them to untap two lands. Yep. Which, and I believe you can go off if you have everything on board with snap. snap. I, I forget exactly how that loop works. Uh, one of capsize, four compulsives, four flickers, three deep analysis... 2-4-C, so, and, you know, dig. And Deep Analysis and 4-C are not bad either. Uh, this list probably could not play Preordain and Ponder because it has so many tap lands. Yep. And then, again, they've got the, you know, Karoo land, land base. Two so, Chanceries, two Aqueducts, Evolving Wilds, Islands Playing Swamps, Terramorphics. Right, so, like we said, this is a very traditional version of this deck. Um, and it, it works the way that the old deck used to work. Um... I think my big issue with this, as we as we mentioned before, is this really gets punished by sideboard land destruction. Yeah, and I think that's a pretty good reason to be mono blue. Yeah, I, even if you're not mono blue, it feels like a decent enough reason well, to skip on the Karoo and, lands. And three colors, I think we've just got touched on this before, three colors is pretty bad in Popper, because all these lands come in tap. And so the great thing about uh, Cloud Fairies was that it only costs two mana, right? Mm-hmm. So you play it on one crew land, you want to tap two crew lands. Yeah. So, like, that was the dream. Um, with the Drake, I don't think it's viable because the Drake costs three more mana. Yeah. I, th- I think the big thing that this list gets is, you know, Sunscape and Nightscape Familiar, instead of Warden of Evil's Isle, I kind of prefer because it does drop the cost of all of your spells. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, um, I wasn't playing Warden of Evo's Isle in my Mono Blue version either. I just don't think it's... it's Like, you can combo with five lands. You don't need to reduce the cost of the uh, Peregrine Drake. I think I think Warden's actual place, once it gets, you know, its full release, is going to be in some sort of, like, Blue-White Skies deck, where... Quartz Guy Fisher yeah. one is good. Yeah. It makes it almost a Delver, right? Yeah. Kind of. I don't know. I used to um, have a foil one of those. I wonder that went. I have to look for it. Hmm. But, yeah, I think I think Warden Vivo's Isle doesn't actually have a place in this list. Like, I think I think people got excited because they saw, oh, we got a flyer that does the fairy thing. And we got something that reduces the cost of flyers without kind of thinking it through and being like, oh, that doesn't actually seem that great in the combo. Um, I definitely think Warden has a different home. I guess at its worst, it's a 2-2 beater, so... I mean, I guess. Like, I don't know. I don't know if I'm pumped on a wind drake. Yeah, we're we're not we're not a big fan of the card. <laughs> I mean, I'm actually a pretty big fan of it, just not in this list. I'm not a big fan of it at all. <laughs> Fair enough. Point. Fair enough. Um, the next list we wanted to talk about was the cynic list that Alex Ullman posted to Gathering Magic in his review. Right, and then this this cynic familiars was also a list instead of. Um, being three colors, and I actually do like this one a little better, it just leverages the fact that you can play Utopia Sprawl on um, a growth chamber. And, and Fertile Ground as well. Yeah, um, so it, it leverages Green's uh, extra mana enchantments. Yeah, so so one Sadro Denizen, two Mnemonic Walls, three Mull Drifters, three Peregrine Drakes, three Seagate Oracles, four Coiling Oracle, which I, I think is I a little spicy. I do like Coiling Oracle a lot. Yeah, it's, it, because it's a 1-1 one, one for 2 with either a card draw or an extra free land draw. Yes. And I think that is super solid in a deck that cares about its lands and digging to very specific well, yeah, cards. because if, if you play the Oracle, so like turn 1, you play uh, Basic and um, something. I, maybe this deck doesn't have turn 1 plays. Yeah. Uh, turn 2, you play the Karoo land. Uh, turn 3, you replay the Basic, you play the Coiling Oracle, and either you hit another Karoo land, which is great, you bounce the Basic back. Um, I- I want to say that Coiling only hits basics, oh. but, um, oh no, it, it, it's just lands. Yes. So yeah, ooh, wow, that's yeah. a that's quick. Like, yeah, so, you know, on turn four you have five mana available. Then there, so th- then we go into the spells. They're running two Giga Drows, which I think is a must in a lot of these, like, all-in combo decks. Oh, uh, maybe they actually running Giga Drows in mind. Yeah, Giga Drows is, you, you, uh, the end of your opponent's turn, you get to totally tap them out. Yeah, so G- Giga Drows, in case people are not familiar with this weird piece of, uh, what is this, Guild Pack tech? Um, one blue, 
and it taps a permanent. It also says replicate, which is, as I referred to it a while ago, manual storm. Mm -hmm. Like, you you pay one blue in this case to put another copy of it onto the stack as it... And there is a deck that's playing Giga Dress. I want to say it is Pedal Festival that might already be playing the Giga Dress. Uh, Pedal Festival and the um, Free from the Real combo decks love this one. Yeah. Um, so, we've also got two moments piece, which I think is great. Yeah, that, because... That was, answers the combo, the aggro. Yeah, so. we were talking about how aggro was an issue. Um, three Ghostly Flicker, three Pulse of Marasa. Also very good against aggro, and I mean, your creatures are lightning rods in this deck, right? Like, it's creature-based combo. Pulse also gets back lands. I did not know that, so yeah. that's pretty good. I, I think in this deck, that is solid. I th- That is that one card where, like, it doesn't blow me away, but... It's just it's, good it's tech. just good enough. Yeah, it's good tech. Eight life is nothing to sneeze at. Six, oh, okay. six, it's still yeah. pretty good. Yeah, no, six six life is a in non insignificant amount, and getting back something that's super important to you. Like I've seen this thrown in like a mono black control list that splashes green for like this and like a couple other things, and it's an instant. So yeah. end of their turn, get it back. But yeah, you could have like the big mana turn of like end of turn, Giga Drows down your lands, Pulse of Marasa back the relevant part of my combo that's in the graveyard. Um, then they're running four Muddle the Mixture. Which, um, what are they getting at two mana here? We have Cooling Oracle, we um, have Moments Peace. Yeah, I think I think you're mostly getting Moments Peace with this. Uh, it also gets Fertile Ground. Okay, okay. Um, I, think, I think that's pretty much it, unless... Yeah, no, that, it, it's just in there to get back, to, to get your Fogs, and, you know... It gets your Coiling Oracles, it gets your Fertile Grounds. Um, one Rolling Thunder, which I believe is the kill con in this. Uh, there's also a Sage's Row, but yeah, you can go yes. either way. Um, because it's running Fertile Ground, two of them, uh, which lets you add a mana of any color when you tap the Enchanted Land, which lets you hit your two red while you're comboing out and, you know, Rolling Thunder, kill their board, and them too. We've also got um, two vessel nascency, which I really like here because you're actually hitting a lot of relevant things uh, because the deck is playing enchantments. It's playing enchantments. It's also got mnemonic wall to get back any milled important pieces that aren't an enchantment creature or exactly. land. And um, then that for you, Fifty Sprawl. Yeah, because we it's got enough force in it to support. You know, Man, I, might, I might build this version. I like this a lot. <laughs> it does seem pretty sweet. Uh, the land base six forest, six island, two radiant fountains, two terramorphics, three evolving wilds. For Simic Growth Chain. And on Mitko, because we don't have access to Merchant Scroll, I wouldn't be surprised if this is, becomes the dominant archetype for this deck, the Simic version. I think the Simic version is very good. I think it's got, like, it's got all these disparate parts which have shown up in other decks. Like, Pulse of Marasa has shown up in Super Grindy decks. Um, Muddle has shown up in uh, Turbo Fog. Um, Giga Drows showed up in Freed from the Real and Petal Festival, as we mentioned. Um, I think it just kind of all clicks. Like this is all good stuff that helps this combo out. Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to think. I'm not sure how quickly you can combo out with this, but this looks like but you probably turn four or five. Yeah, and so you're able to protect yourself long enough to combo. I think yeah, I think that's incredibly relevant. The moments piece, the two moments pieces are equivalent to four fogs. Mm-hmm. Like, are they really going to bring in sideboard hate for your fogs? I don't know. That seems well. You know, you can graveyard hate. Yeah, I would still graveyard hate a little. I mean, I mean, you you, you bring in the graveyard hate against this deck just because you can stop the ghostly flicker. Mm-hmm. Um, but I definitely, I definitely really like this list. I think this is interesting. A really solid one. Not running capsize. Not running capsize. I think just because capsize is a little bit more mana, and this was designed for Mitko, and those clicks at the time. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I like the Simic version of this more now that, now that you're having to get to a higher initial mana investment for the Drake, Mm -hmm. I like this idea of just ramp into it real quickly, hit the combo, and then go to town. Um, our last one is a... Nice little, uh, nice little spicy ditty from a local player. Which, as we we, we discussed earlier, don't don't play this on Mitko. It's it's not yeah, going to this, work. This deck's not going to work on Mitko. Uh, this is purely paper, and it's essentially it's teachings 
right? But with a transformational sideboard. Yep. So main deck, it is just, you know, it's a variant of teachings, because I can't, I can't say it's a stock list, because there isn't a stock list for this deck. Uh, yeah. This is um, three Seagate Oracles, three Mnemonic Walls, a Gurmag Angler. And, you know, Nathan liked uh, Mnemonic Wall even before this combo had come out. Yeah, um, actually, since he and I, you know, both play grindy decks and, you know, we'd always go to time, he had spoken before there was any inkling that Peregrine Drake was going to come out that he had considered throwing the Fairies combo into his sideboard for super grindy matchups. So that's basically what this deck does. I mean, it's, a, it's a mirror breaker at the very worst. Yeah. Um, so he runs the only sort of uh, the only sort of weird main deck inclusion is Whispers of the Muse. Um, one blue draw card buyback five, um, which seems fine in a big mana deck that wants to draw a bunch of cards and you know get to its answers quickly. Um, but then when we go over the, the real innovation here is the sideboard. So the sideboard. Two Nihil Spell Bombs, two Dispels, a Negate, a cha- two Chainers Edict, two Even Card Justice. A one count of Perplex. I actually don't know what Perplex does. I have to look it up. Perplex, out. counter-target spell unless its controller discards his or her hand. Brutal. But it also has Transmute, and it costs one, a black, and a can you, blue. Can you discard your hand if you have zero cards in your hand? Yes. It, okay. it, it is just useless against a Hellbent opponent. Okay. But it doesn't it, transmute, though. It transmutes specifically... For Ghostly Flicker. Mm-hmm. Three mana. Um, and, you know, obviously it's already running Teachings, so it's got that going for it. Um, but he has an extra Ghostly Flicker and three Peregrine Drake. So as he explained the combo, you set up your Peregrine Drake mnemonic wall on the board. You flicker both of them, untap lands, get infinite mana, that whole shenanigan. Then... You loop Whispers of the Muse, draw your whole deck, set up another flicker loop that flickers the wall and either a Radiant Fountain or a Pristine Talisman to gain infinite life, and then you even cards Justice over and over and over. Yeah, on Moto that would take forever. I do not expect to see this variant on Moto. No, but I do really like this for paper, Mm-hmm. And I might have to sleeve this one up just because I think that, you know, this is a... Teaching is already a very good deck. Mm-hmm. I think this gives it some level of game against the faster aggro decks because it does give them a combo out. It can go off by, like, turn five or so. Um, this, this deck doesn't need help against the aggro decks, though. So. Uh, some aggro decks, I think it does. Okay, that's fair. I think, you know, Kiln Fiend sometimes just, you know, just gets the nut girl. But he's, but he's running, like, four Edicts. Yeah, he's, he's running plenty of Edicts. I just think... I, I, it also helps in the grindy matchups, you know? Yeah. The ones where you're about, always going to go to time, and, you know, there's a danger of someone losing just by milling themselves out from card draw. Oh, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but... I think this one is one of the more interesting ones. It's definitely a paper-only option because, you know, you can demonstrate a loop in paper. Mitgo does not have functionality to demonstrate loops. Um, something that they could, you know, maybe get on? I don't know. But I think that's definitely the most interesting one. I don't know if it's the best option, but it certainly is an option that's available. Um, so, these are four takes on the Peregrine Drake thing. Um, I'd also seen people talking about, you know, a Mono Blue Tron list running it. Yeah, that way, well, attacking the Tron lands is just, you know, hashtag yeah. value. I, so, so, I mean, you play more Miko than I do. Does that speed up, you know, the time to combo out? Is that, like, a worthwhile consideration for this deck? Um... We're talking about, yeah, Blue Tron, and then Wing Con is Rolling Thunder? Uh, I don't know. I'm not Rolling Thunder. I, I guess, you know, you're, you stick with the Sage Road Denizen or the well, Compulsive Research. You just mill them out. Yeah. I think it could help. I think Tron, out of all these decks, though, needs this the least because they're playing the control deck until they kill you with, like, Ulamox Crusher or Rolling Thunder. Well, I'd also seen people suggesting 
just toss Peregrine Drake into Tron. Yeah, I don't think they really... I think they could just... Yeah, I think they could just toss it in and it'd be fine. Yeah, like, not not even as a combo, just saying, like, all right, uh, what? So, so... Well, if you go, like, Peregrine Drake, Peregrine Drake, Blue Ox Crusher, like, that's hard to beat. Yeah. I mean, you could also do it just to pump up a huge um, Rolling Thunder by yeah. Rug Tron, you know, just... So what? You If you're paying seven mana with your... Actually, wait, you get five Tron lands, so... Let's say four towers and one other piece. Mm-hmm. That's t- 15 mana? Or, or four towers 14. and one other piece. That's actually not 15 mana. That's four 14. mana. Four towers and one other Tron land? Well, well assuming you okay. have Tron on board. Sorry, <laughs> okay. sorry. I should have clarified. You have Tron on board, and you know, you're, you're, you're in the yes. absolute nut hand scenario. Of, you know, yeah, 14 damage is... I mean, well, you're probably going to win the game. Well, so, so you pay, you, pay four, you put 14 in your mana pool, you use five of that, you have not you have nine left over, and then you tap all that again. Like that's serious amounts of damage. That's pretty good. I don't know. It's a it's, it's, it's all right. It's all right. Yeah. <laughs> you just don't want us suggesting Tron to anyone, do you? No. Well, just don't. I don't know. Don't play Fangor and Marauder. Don't, don't play I know. Marauder. It's the bane of my existence. Um. I, I kind of at this point just want to put Fangor and Marauder in something just to spite you. You just would like. <laughs> <laughs> like not not even Tron, just some of you slow would. and slow and grindy and gets there eventually. It's a five five. That's a big body. You know You wouldn't dare. <laughs> um But I don't know. Do you do you think this is actually gonna split the format open and, you know, tear reality at the seams? Uh there was a familiar combo deck before. There's a familiar combo deck again. Uh, I don't really think the format's going to be split open. I think that's I think that's magic players being magic players. No it, one likes. No one really likes seeing a lot. A lot of people, excuse me. I like to say no one. I feel like a lot of people don't really like seeing the meta game change. But that's magic, you know. Like think about legacy. Where were we before Deathrite Shaman and Breath Decay? You yeah. Know? Like, what, what were people? I don't even know what people were doing before that. I mean, so I think one of the other things to consider here is you know. Who suffers by having a very efficient and reliable combo deck? And it's not really the super hard control decks. It's not really the super aggro decks. I think, you know, who suffers is mid-range. Oh, you mean like Jess Guy Kitty? Uh, Kitty probably, you know, will take a hit after this. And, you know, a lot of the like, kind, of, kind of dirtily mid-range decks are not going to have a great time with this. Um, but... Apart from that, you know... Just got, well, we've, we've talked about this before. Sorry, listeners. We've talked about how Just Guy Kitty is maybe not the best deck already. <laughs> like, it's already, like... You do cool things. You draw you draw more cards. Your, your threats are good. But that deck has never really clicked for me. I'm like, it's perfectly capable of winning, but it just is like... Well, you kind you're of... doing all this stuff. Why aren't you just winning the game? It you know? kind of always swoops in, like, when the meta is kind of shaken up. After a new set release where the meta shifts a lot, or after a banning is kind of its prime time to shine, um, you've got, I don't know, like, I feel i feel like combo needs to have a role in this format. Yes, and we've talked about it before, yeah. Uh, I think it's, we're, we're the only format without a combo deck. Well, I guess, I'm not counting standard. Because Wizards will never print combo decks for standard really. Well, well you, mean, you mean like an infinite combo. Yeah, we're, we're the only format of you know, Legacy, Modern, Vintage. Uh, you know, the Eternal formats, the quote-unquote yeah. Eternal formats. I know Modern's not technically the Eternal format. Um, that does not have some sort of infinite combo. And it's, you know, it's part of magic. Infinite well, combos are part of magic. And so... Well, I feel like there's an important clarifier here. Like, not just an infinite combo, but a reliable one. Yes, because I, I don't know if we said it on the the podcast that I don't think Pedal Festival is that good of a deck. And I know that I did mention they did win a tournament in Argentina and I saw that on Reddit. But you know, spiking one tournament doesn't make your deck good. You I, know? I I think I think the issue with Pedal Festival is it's a very draw dependent deck. Right. Like you can just out of nowhere brick. And that's not really a great thing for a combo deck because once familiars gets online and you don't have that answer, you just kinda sit there and wait for them to combo out. Because yeah, it's pretty academic for them. Yeah, like, there's a certain point where it's just like, okay, you got it, show me. 
And I, I think, you know, Pedal Festival has a lot of things that can go wrong with it. Like, you can get your land with all the enchantments on it bounce. You can have it blown up. You can have a couple of enchantments removed, slowing you down just enough that you've got to, like, rebuild. And they can get in for those last points of damage. And, you know, there's other combos, like Freed from the Real, which... I also don't, don't think that's a Tier 1 deck. It's, I, I don't think it's a Tier 1 deck. I think the version that um, Aleppo Pores piloted to second place at one of the Card Kingdom Rags to Riches was way more interesting. He was running, like, Life Spark Spellbomb and Wind Zendikon. Okay, I can see that. Like, pretty fine. He, he definitely... Because he, he basically just makes the land into the creature. Like, it's just a solid creatureless list. Except for Valakut Invoker, which was his main con. That sounds kind of... It reminds me kind of a Jess Guy ascendancy combo from Modern a few yeah. years ago. Yeah, and I think, you know, whether you liked it or not in Modern, like, Splinter Twin kind of filled that role of, you know, here is the combo deck in the format. This is, you know, it has game outside of the combo... It can sometimes just be a value blue-red deck, and if nothing else, it's always got this fallback of, I have an infinite combo in my deck. Um, and, you know, I don't really play a modern ever, so... Why you would know. you, with a degenerate format? <laughs> but, like, I know some people thought that it was unfair to have that deck in the format, but I feel like we do want some kind of combo deck so people, you know, can play something better than Pedal Festival, play something better than Presence of Gom combo. And look, I know people don't like, like, it, it sucks losing to a combo. I got turned one by Storm and Legacy the other day. You know, like, <laughs> like I, I understand why people don't like combo decks, but they're a part of Magic, you know, and... As long as the deck isn't extremely oppressive, and that was a problem with Cloud of Fairies, right? It's like, even the non-combo deck for playing Cloud of Fairies, because even without the combo, it's just a very good value card. I, I think Paragon Drake's kind of the same way, but... Well, I it think doesn't come down on turn two. It doesn't come down on turn two. It doesn't... It doesn't you can't go Paragon Drake into two open mana turn two. Yeah. And, and, and I think that that was way more oppressive than the Familiar's combo deck. Even though I think the Familiar's combo deck was extremely good, it was one of the best decks in the format at the time... Part of it was just, you know, turn one Delver, turn two flip Delver, play Cloud of Fairies, and counter your turn two. Yeah. You know, and that sucks. I, and I think, you know, Delver is still putting up numbers, although, actually, I don't know if you saw this, Delver is not the top of the standards yeah, I heard right it was now. Stompy. Stompy. Which I have never, ever played against online. I have, like, Stompy's a good deck. It's a good deck, but, like, who is playing it? Why have I never, ever seen it online? When I play, like, I, I acknowledge it's, you know, a good deck, and people are playing it and piloting it to 5-0s. I'm just, like, baffled that I never seem to see it. I also don't know what happened that made it so good all of a sudden. I don't think it got anything new. It didn't. It just, I guess people are just piloting it better. Or, you know, I, I do know that Wizards only releases 10 5-0s from the leagues. Oh, really? So, yeah, uh, we don't get all the results. I didn't know that. That's interesting because that completely changes the uh, the, meta, the, the MTG Goldfish metagame analysis. Well, I mean, it could just be one of those weeks where, you know, the randomly selected decks have slightly more stompy decks than Delver and it's not actually representative of the metagame. That's or, weird. Yeah. Um, I don't know why they don't release all of it. I mean, it doesn't, I don't think it hurts them in any way and it's all automated, I'm assuming. If they, I really yeah. hope it's automated. Like, I, I hope there's not some the, more... The end turn... I hope there's not some poor intern sitting there typing out deck lists. No, it has from to be. That's crazy. You know, and I've actually... You, that makes sense because I 5 would some stuff, and my results don't get posted on Goldfish, and I was like, what? Yeah, no. Ever since they shifted over to the leagues, they don't report every single 5 list. Also, the leagues are just, like, the best thing that's ever happened. There were no popper dailies, and the leagues are basically the popper dailies now. Yeah, I, I mean, again, I'm more of a paper person, but, like... Yeah, I I definitely can see leagues being very very appealing, but and also also the other thing is NBC's back up there. Yeah, NBC you know vacillates depending on I I think that's one where it's how well are people doing with it. Well, right now they're dead even in the format sixteen point fifty nine sixteen point yeah for Stompy and Delver, um, but it's Affinity up to these days. Affinity, I don't know. You you play a weird list. No oh, somber hover guard. My list isn't. Weird. Maybe I'll start playing this. This looks good. What? Just this this list. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Spreading seas. 
Land land denial, dude. Gets the job done sometimes. But this is this is just red. Yeah. Um so you know, I think that we deserve a combo deck. I think it makes it's going to deform the meta. Now whether it deforms it in like a harmful way, I don't know. Because we haven't we haven't seen how it shakes out, right? Like we need to at least give it a chance to see if it's going to be, you know, a real problem. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I I never really minded familiars. You know, when we were paper. when we were talking about Cloud Fairies maybe getting banned initially, I was I said to you, "There's no way they're going to ban Cloud Fairies. It's not that bad." You know, and I, I maybe I was just too in my own head at the time, but at the time I really didn't think it was that oppressive. You know, and it's only now, like afterward that we can maybe see that it was, you know, maybe a bad thing for the meta. So I, th- I think part of the other thing that people objected to with Cloud of Fairies was the fact that it did stifle some people from brewing. Like, there were just some lists that would never oh, boo, quite make boo. it. Oh, Band Brainstorm, too, I guess, right? No, 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 no. I, I, I definitely think that, you know, with Cloud, it was. Okay. A little oppressive okay. to, like, the outside decks. I think Peregrine Drake is more reliable in the combo because you need to assemble less parts. Like, you just need Peregrine Drake, Arcanomancer, or Mnemonic Wall, and Flicker, Mm -hmm. and five lands to cast all of it. And that's all you need. Um, I don't think it's going to completely cut off brewing. And, you know, I do think brewing's important because every so often someone hits on something where it's like, oh, this is actually super cool. Um, I definitely, you know, I don't, I don't think anyone who brews and then complains that, you know, the meta is too established really has much of a claim to that argument. Mm -hmm. And I know, I know someone is going to dislike the fact that I'm saying this, but I, you know, show up with brews and rogue decks. And if I get beaten by established meta decks, it just means, you know, either I was playing suboptimally or... I failed to take these decks into consideration. And either way, that means I've got work to do. It's not, you know... I don't think that, you know, a solved format is... Or quote-unquote solved format is impenetrable. Like, I've I've foroed events that are LGS with, like, jank. Like, there's no other way to say it. Like, I have played decks that I went in and I was like... This is garbage, but I'm going to play the hell out of it, and I'm going to get to a 4 out. Pig, salt type pig control? Yep. I 4 I four with that, I think, twice. Like, it's just it's just a matter of knowing the deck. Like, I'm going to change my affinity list. This deck actually looks really good. Sorry, while you've been talking about this, I've been looking at this affinity list, and I, I think I'm going to switch to this. Even though it runs 4 Flare Husk? You know, if everyone is doing it, maybe I'm the one doing something wrong. Um... I don't know, you know, I think it's good in this list, but that's just me. I don't, well, I don't play this deck, so... I, I'm going to try it out. I'm going to try it out. But, um, yeah, no, I think I think that combo has been lacking. I think we've got a very real combo deck. Yes. It's going to take some time to, you know, see, is it a little too real, or is this an acceptable amount of, like, good, reliable combo for the meta? Mm-hmm. And... I don't know. I'm I'm not upset about I'm, it. I'm pretty optimistic about it, honestly. I don't think it's going to be super impressive. I think we're, I think we're going to have to see on Friday what happens. Yeah, or we're, we're going to have to wait till really we're going to have to wait till it comes out on Moto, and then and then like like another three weeks. So we're actually talking about like we're not going to really know the impact of this deck on the meta for maybe another two months here. Yeah, and you know I think that'll give the meta time to sort out like I guess what is the best answer here, like. Is it this cynic list? Is it mono blue? Is it a Tron shell? Is it, you know, traditional Esper? The one thing I think we can agree on is that Peregrine Drake is fantasy play in the format. Yes, I don't think there's any question about that. Like, out of all of the stuff that we got in EMA, hands down, this is going to be the most impactful. You know, I want it to be Nimble Mongoose. I want, like, a sweet little new aggro trick. Everyone says it's super good, but I have yet to see a list that really impresses me surface. And you know what it is? It's because it has Shroud and not Hexproof. Yeah. That's, I, that's like... I mean, Stompy doesn't want it. I think it goes in some sort of threshold shell. If it had Hexproof, I think Boggles would play it. 
Oh, we could add hex proof boggles and play it in a heartbeat. Yeah. Um, I'm still like I, I've been playing around. Uh, actually, I do have a correction from our last episode when we talked about Yavamaya Enchantress. There is a key difference between that card and Oren Arlen. Besides the can't be blocked by creatures with less power, Oren Arlen counts auras. Uh, Yavamaya Enchantress counts enchantments. That is a pretty big difference, actually. So, you know, we don't have full support for, like, an Enchantress-style deck like Legacy has, because we don't have, like, Mesa Enchantress or Vajoran yeah, Enchantress. There's no draw card. But, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of tempted to throw together some, like, kind of janky list where I get to run four journeys and four Banshee rings. Oh, okay, yeah, that's fair. Uh, Banishing Light's also never been really common. Oh, O-Ring's better anyway. O-Ring is better, because... Because split triggers are a poorly designed choice on Wizard's part. Or an excellent design choice, depending on who you ask. Yeah. Um, I mean, have you ever seen White Blue Tron and the trick of capsizing an O-Ring just to slowly exile everything? Uh, no, but that is a real <laughs> thing. It's just it's nine mana. In Tron. Oh yeah, it's fine. <laughs> no one's it, ever, no one has ever done that to me personally, but I do see that being a very good thing. I I, I saw one week at FNM someone explaining that to a relatively new player, and just watching this person's eyes glaze over and like the life leave their eyes, just like oh, because there's no soul left in their body. <laughs> yeah, no, there's I don't know. Um, I I definitely want to try out a sort of enchantressy popper brew. And see what comes of that. I don't know if it's going to be good, but it's definitely not going to be Boggles good. Also, can we talk for a second about Five Color Boggles and why the hell has that thing been putting up good results? I don't know. The deck is garbage. Did you uh, d- did you watch the MTG Goldfish playthrough with it? The... No. Dude, it was terrible. Like, I don't know. So it's five colors. It's splashing black for dead weight. Splashes blue for Hydroblast, red for Electricery, and the catch is, the only way to get those colors of mana is three Crumbling Vestige, which is the, the taps for colorless. That is, that, that's, that just seems so bad. You're playing a five-color deck and you're playing a card that taps for colorless mana after its first use. Yeah, it also runs Holdout Settlement, the one which is, it's a spring leaf draw. Yeah, well, I don't like that either, okay. Yeah, no, like, this, it does run Core Skyfisher to reuse the Crumbling Vestiges, but, like, that seems like trash to me. And this deck has 11 decks that put up 5-0 results in the past week. Makes up 4.8% of the meta. I have no idea why this is sitting at 4.8% of the meta when Traditional Boggles is at 2. I feel like Traditional Boggles, like, maybe this is, like, I'm totally off base here, and I'm just bad at playing aggro decks, which I'm fully willing to admit, like, I, I can play control deck any day of the week. Aggro, totally lost on me. I do not understand it. But, like, maybe there's something I'm missing, but it's apparently, you know, putting up twice the results that Boggles is, and Boggles just looks, like, much more focused. It seems like this deck knows what it wants to do. I gotta go fast, gotta crack in with my armadillo cloak for a million goddamn damage and, you know, never get hurt again. Yeah, this deck just seems better. And the, the other deck's not even play, doesn't even have the decency to play Ancestral Mask. Like, I don't know, it's just weird to me. Right. It's like, Ancestral Mask. Yeah, look, there's no Ancestral Mask. Yeah, it's, and like, the five-color version runs and, Molder and Vibe like, Cloak. And it has to play Karametra's Favor, that can't be good. I don't know, it just seems like you're jumping through a lot of hurdles to get Electricery and Hydroblast. Like, is your Elves matchup that bad? Or is, like, Electricery for the Mirror? Like, what's going on here? That's my thing. I don't know, it's just very strange to me that this is doing as well as it is. It seems kind of, again, like, maybe I'm just missing something here. Well, but, it's not really five colors, right? Like, it's playing the Heliots Pilgrim, the Tutor, the one-up Dead Wave. But look, it's... It runs it's, Ethereal Armor as well. It's, ethereal it's got, Armor's white, though. Like, so it's got, was, it's got white? That was already a, a white green card. Yeah. It, it's got Dead Wave for black, it's got Electricity for red, it's got Hydroblast for blue. 
but it seems like it's stretching its mana super, super thin. Also, only two Rancors? Yeah. I don't know. Like, I'm baffled by this. Like, someone, please explain to me why I'm wrong. Like, I really want to hear why this deck is good. Because on paper, this looks like a... This looks like someone trying to shoehorn stuff in Boggles that it has no place running. I don't know. Like, maybe... Okay. I could see the concession if Heliod's Pilgrim tutored to the battlefield because of that weird interaction with Hexproof. Mm-hmm. Where if an enchantment enters without being cast... It can go on to a hexproof guy. I could see that maybe, mm-hmm. but as it stands, I don't know. I just don't get this. Maybe I'm old. <laughs> You're just an old fogey. Banding. That's what we need. <laughs> yes, banding and rampage. Bring back rampage. But I don't know. the 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 meta right now looks pretty, you know, healthy online. And I think you know. This Friday, I'm hoping for a pretty decent meta in our paper format, and I don't know what I'm playing, actually. I'm kind of, you know, in the middle of a mono-red heroic kick, maybe something in that vein. I won't be there. I, I, will, be, I will be drafting Eternal Master, that another store. Sorry, everyone. Yeah, you will. I'm the worst. But then I'll come back with my newly tuned affinity list and see what happens. You, you could also play something else. Why? <laughs> I mean, why on earth would I do that, Mike? I get, I get, I guess this is a format where you know knowing your own deck is almost as good as playing a good list. Just knowing all the ins and outs. I also like to note one of my arch nemesis has been doing extremely well with this deck. Oh, the five color boggles. Yeah. Shh. Say his name three times, he'll appear. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. I, I, I can. You see got re- you got really salty with me on Moto once, and maybe we don't call people out by name on this podcast. Yeah, why did you do that, Mike? You have to edit that out. <laughs> but, like, edit it out, but keep the rest of the conversation in here. Yeah, so that people could know that I have enemies. Yeah, we we we, we can definitely do that. But to be to be fair, you also collect photos of everyone who's ever gotten salty with you on video. It's true. If you get salty with me, I will take your picture, and I will put it in my collection. <laughs> just just fill it up the salt mine. Yeah, dude. I mean, people, like, I, I don't ever really talk to people on Moto, and this is just, like, a common courtesy thing. Like, you wouldn't say stuff like, like what, see, some of the things I've been, that some people have said to me on Medco, you wouldn't say to an in-person opponent. Oh, no. You wouldn't, you just wouldn't. Like, it's so rude, and it makes, like, why are you trying to make me feel bad for winning? Like, so just common courtesy, man. Like, don't get mad at me because you're losing the game. I don't know. Like, I'm definitely that way in person as well. Like, even if I get absolutely crushed in a game, you know, and, I've like, on the rare occasions where I'm like, oh, God, now I'm a little pissed off. Well, you, yeah, if I'm mad in person, I still say good game. I shake the hand. I, I, and then I complain to someone else about it. I don't. I wouldn't say to someone's face, like, Oh, you're just so super, you're just super lucky, better lucky. Some people have said better lucky than good to me. And I'm like, is it lucky when I draw 30 cards out of my deck? That's back when I was playing the, uh, the Atog combo deck. Like, well, that doesn't seem lucky to me. That sounds like I drew 30 cards, you know? Yeah. If you have bad enough luck that 30 cards aren't getting you what you need, you've got other problems. Like, yeah. That's, like, you're, you're just a statistical So anomaly. this is just, consider this my soapbox PSA. Be nice to your opponents on Moto. Don't get salty with them. If you get salty, yell at your computer. Don't let them know that you got mad because it's just super unprofessional. It's super tacky. And, like, I get that it's, that you're not a professional, okay? But, like, don't say something to someone on Moto that you wouldn't say to their face. Also, don't do this shit in person. Yeah, like, no, yeah, definitely. I'm not, I'm not saying do this in person and that makes it okay to do on Moto. No, well, I'm just thinking, like, I've, I've seen people tilt out at our events when, like, like, especially against control decks, which I feel is, you know, something that a lot of players have, like, a lot of animosity towards. The idea, like, control decks aren't fun or fair, and it's like, no, they're actually, for the most part, extremely fair. Yeah. I don't know. Like, I'm very much not in the camp of getting salty, because this is a children's card game at the end of the day. Yeah. Like, I am showing up at f and to play for, you know, maybe 24 bucks worth of store credit. I'm not on the Pro Tour. I'm not, you know, making my living off this. It's something I do on Friday nights to unwind from a stressful work. 
So, I don't know. I've never understood that point of view where you can get salty enough to, you know, start yelling at your opponent. Yeah. It... Yeah, it just... It makes me really uncomfortable, too. And, you know, if you're... You just shouldn't take out your frustration on your opponent. Like, your deck didn't do well, or you didn't play optimally, or, you know, the sky fell, and I was able to have the god drop. But, like, don't make your opponent feel bad for having won the game. Also, like... I don't know, like... When people tilt out about, like, flooding out or, like, getting mana screwed, it's even more baffling because it's like, that's just luck. Like... Yeah, well... It, do, yeah. It's the same as tilting out when you lose the die roll for who plays first. Like, it's the same exact thing. It's, you know, if you haven't drawn a... Bu- if you've drawn, like, half your deck and you see no well, lands, maybe you get a roll salty. And the reason I, I even bring this up is I ended up blocking this guy. Because it was so bad. Really? Yeah, I ended up like blocking him. So because he grinds a lot of popper leagues, and so when I play against him, I don't want to listen to him like trash talking me every single time we meet up. Like I'm here to play popper. I'm not here to like ruin his day. I'm here. I'm here to play popper. And so you know, sorry we got paired together. Sorry I beat you. You know? Yeah. I mean, I also definitely feel like there's a difference. Like the there's definitely because of our relatively small play group in paper, we definitely do give each other a little bit of hell. For it, like no, I, that's 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 yeah. different. I feel like that's totally different because, like, I will tell people, you know, better lucky than good, and fully that's, be joking. That, yeah, that's different too. But yeah. just the animosity over the internet, no, right. not the anonymity, just the animosity that some people project because they could be anonymous. Yeah. So, so I, gu- I guess that's our nice little after school special. You know, don't be a dick on the internet. Yeah, and I mean, it's so hard for some people that they just like have to be a dick. But, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I hardly even say, like, good luck to my opponents because I... You don't want to open that avenue? Yeah, I don't, I don't want to open the avenue that maybe we're going to be talking during this match. You don't want to remind them that there's a chat box that they can I'll, use? I'll close the chat box a lot of the time. But the only reason not to close the chat box is that also the game log is in the chat box. <laughs> so if you close the chat box, you can't see the game log anymore. And if you want to see where your opponent has scribe cards, it's actually kind of important. Yeah. So actually, one of the other things that I think we should talk about is on Reddit there was a thread that was actually the the original poster mentioned us talking about the fact that we get to play Popper in paper at our LGS. And there for was FNM no less. For F and M, yeah. So we we get full prize support, you know, all Promos, that good stuff. Everything. Yeah. Promos have been pretty sweet. Uh, Goblin of War Chief was an unexpected doozy of a promo. Mm-hmm. Um, but they were trying to get together a list of all the places where you can go to play Paper Popper. Um, Regardless of country, nation, race, creed, we all want to play Popper. So get on that list, add your local game store. And we actually have, fortunately, in the studio with me today, a guru on how to set up Popper <laughs> at your LGS, because Mike pretty much did that. Yeah, Single-handedly? so... No, there were other people involved. But definitely, you know... We're going to link that thread in the comments, and there's a link to a Google Doc that I actually put up there that you can contribute to if there's a place near you that does popper. Whether it's FNM, whether it's, you know, something like Card Kingdom where you get a couple of events every few months, we really would love to have this resource available to the community so that way we can continue to grow these local popper communities. Yes, because, we, you know, we're on Moto, the next logical step. People want to play this, this, this stuff. Excuse me. People want to play this stuff in paper. And I'm not saying there's going to be a popper GP, but it would be nice if we at least got a side event. And I know that that's a whole other thing where Wizards has to fix the popper ban list. Um, if you want resources on that, uh, a lot of places have the recommended extended ban list of uh, what they ban in addition to the regular popper ban list. A lot of places turn to the Card Kingdom ban yeah. list because it seems to be a pretty solid list of stuff that can get cut. Um, so locally... This actually all started just on a local area Facebook group for Magic players. And someone else had posted, I want to play Popper. Is there anywhere that sanctions it? I immediately saw this. I replied, I want to play Popper. I like Popper. Count me in. And one other dude replied. We had three people in this thread. And the local, the owner of local game store, Pat's Games stepped in and said, we can sanction Popper as an FNM event. And it was really fortunate, because this was also around the time that Wizards was like, you can sanction whatever you want. Yeah. And 
I think when we started, we just said Mitgo ban list. Anything that's been printed at Common, whether it was on Mitgo or in paper, and we added him to Torok because that was like the obvious feel bad card, and we just kind of let it go. Um, I think along the way, I've learned a lot of stuff about organizing Popper um, and what drives people who play this format. Um, you know, if you're trying to get a group started up, it really helps if you have a good relationship with your local game store, you know, say hi to the people, be nice, you know, networking, that whole thing. But also realize why people are playing Popper. Locally, we've kind of got two camps. We've got people who play Legacy who want a change of pace. And we have people who are working with a budget, and Popper is a cheaper eternal format where, you know, they can buy a deck and just keep playing it with relatively few changes for years. So realizing that there are those two separate groups, I think is very important because certain things appeal to one group, certain things appeal, appeal to another group. The thing I've noticed is one of the things that appeals the most to both of those groups is not having your prizes be in packs. A lot of places love to do f and prizes in the form of boosters. I don't think this is a good idea. Like, would, would you play at our f and if you got boosters instead of store credit? I want to... S- I want to begrudgingly say yes, but I think a store would be crazy to not offer store credit. Yeah. And because I, that's free money for them, basically. Well, so there was another store here, which, you know, I'm not going to dredge up the name of, who wanted to offer packs for a popper event that they were trying to put together. It, we No one went. No, no one went because a lot of the people who play Popper are interested in eternal formats, or at least non-rotating, since that's technically what modern is classified yes. as. Um, so they want to be able to get cards for their formats. Exactly. Like, I definitely, you know, while grinding Popper every Friday, will take my store credit and turn it into stuff for my cubes or legacy cards. Dude, I bought two chalices of the void with all the winnings I've made off Popper. Like, so, it's a thing. Yeah, I definitely think that's a big incentive. Um, the other side of that is, um, like, Card Kingdom does their Rags to Riches, which we have referenced so many times at this point. But It's really the, the closest thing we have to a proper GP right now. So. Yeah. They always offer their prizes in the form of modern and legacy staples. So stuff like Tarmogoyf, which is equally applicable in both formats. Dark Confidant, played in both formats. I believe that you can take store credit as an option for those tournaments. And, you know, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe I remember on one of their streams them mentioning that you could also just take store credit equal to the value of the prize. Um, So I think it's very important for places not to simply view Popper as, you know, a format for people who can't afford other formats. I think it's important that it's viewed as a somewhat serious eternal format. Like, obviously, it's not something that people grind for, you know, their hopeful Pro Tour appearance. But, I mean, it's it's a, it's a casual format, technically, but it's actually pretty competitive, yeah, by and large. You know, like, the, the, every archetype is represented. Um, it's You can play with all the cards that have ever printed at Common. Uh, you can play with a lot of really powerful cards. And, you know, if you're listening to our podcast, you know all this already. But you just need to make a case for that to other people. And you can also, if the store owners are like, yeah, you can say, well, what about moving all these old commons you have? You know, if you have a popper in your metagame, suddenly these commons are worth a lot more because people are going to want them. Yeah, I mean, if I, I've actually spoken to people at our LGS and they've said, you know, we actually run out of stuff for popper. Which means, you know, they're moving like these 50 cent cards, which otherwise would have just been put in bulk and sold off that way. Um, so I think one of the big things that stands in the way of getting Popper started in a lot of areas is this misconception that it is a low power format. And I think by dispelling that myth, people become a lot more interested because people forget, like, there's been a lot of really interesting stuff printed at common. Like people forget that Gush is a common, people forget Brainstorm's a common, 
you Old, know, yeah, Delver. We, we get to play Dave. all of the cantrips. We get to play Dave. We get to play all these crazy and cards. Blue is just stupid good. So. Yeah, you get to you get to play affinity with artifact lands mm-hmm. in a format of common. So mm-hmm. like they, 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 they had a cranial planning. They did. There's a very good reason for that, sir. Yes. But I think one of the things that really helps is demonstrating to people that this is not, you know, baby's first format. It's a serious format with serious cards in it. Um, and I think one of the other things that really helped out was locally, um, Logan, who works at our LGS, um, he threw together decks. He threw together basically, I think, like, eight pauper decks and would loan them out on Friday. And this is actually a great strategy because people who want to play Magic, more often than not, and I know there's exceptions, I'm kind of an exception to this, if there is Magic to be played, they will play whatever it is rather than not play Magic. I don't feel that way about Commander. I almost always hate myself when I play it. But I'm just saying, if there if there is Magic to be played, Magic players will play it. Yeah. Regardless of what it is. I, I definitely think that by having, whether it's you or someone else, having loaner decks. Like, I now have uh, one of the KMC Thousand Count boxes, and it is filled with popper decks. And I will throw it in my bag, and when I show up on Friday night, if people want to play but don't have a deck with them, I'll say, you know, here. Here's goblins. Here's teachings. I have two loaners myself now. And I I think that by having those decks and being able to say, you know, hey, play Popper with me, no investment, but if you decide to play, these decks are dirt cheap. Yeah, well, and you also, you have to also explain to people, if I was talking about a format where the decks are uh, Delver, Elves, Burn, and Affinity, what format do you think I'm talking about? They'll probably say Modern. Yeah. No, I'm talking about Popper. Yeah, no, I, I think it's very important that in the process of selling Popper to people, that you remind them that, you know, it's not commons from recent sets. These are commons that see play in Legacy and other, like, non-rotating formats. So I think the combination of having decks available so people can show up, and if they're mildly interested in Popper, they can just play. They don't need to, you know order a deck and, you know, find out that your LGS is out of, like, four cards for it or what have you. I think that's a super, super important part of this, is just making it available. And the best thing is, you can throw together a box full of popper decks for not all that much, and you do have the side benefit of then you can play a lot of different decks. Yeah, um, popper is great if you are a type of person who you don't like to play a deck for more than like a week or two. I, I am definitely guilty of that. I have like the worst deck in ADD in the world. And, and, I'm, and like what you also said, Popper simultaneously rewards people who want to play one deck and become very deep with that deck. But that being said, the decks are like 40 bucks. If you can't shell 40 bucks for a deck, maybe you shouldn't be playing Magic. I know it's kind of judgmental, but... I mean, I mean, there's, you know, there are people who play limited formats That's for that true. reason. And, you know, I actually got one of my friends um, who was a casual player. He was very interested in Popper purely because it was a budget format. You know, he said, I want to, I want to play with you, but I can't invest $600 in a deck, and I was like, play popper. Yeah, um, I think, I, since I'm actually, like, a bit of a perfectionist when it comes to having everything available for myself, I actually set up a spreadsheet, which tracks all the prices of popper staples, and that way I can check it off so, you know, I don't wind up with, like, 20 copies of Counterspell. I just have my playset, set. Mm-hmm. My beautiful Ice Age Counterspells, which everyone hates. You're welcome for the white border one. Yes, you, you did give me a lovely white bordered one, um, but I have this spreadsheet and the entire format, the whole thing, four copies of every staple played in a deck in like the past two years comes out to like just shy of one thousand bucks. Legacy deck right there, you know, one legacy deck. Uh, that's like burn or another like yeah, low yeah, cost it's a low, legacy. Like a, it's a low lower cost legacy yeah. deck. Yeah, like this is a cheap format. Like there are certain bits that are pricier. You know, the cantrips are a buck a piece. The blue the blue can- one mana cantrips are all like a buck a piece or so. Like we're not saying go out and spend a thousand dollars and buy this format. You know, but we are saying if you have a thousand bucks and you want to own an entire format, you can. Mm-hmm. So, 
Yeah, I think definitely selling... Also, like, it's funny because people wind up pimping out their popper decks with, like, foils. You, you, you have almost all of Affinity foiled out. That is correct. I deeply enjoy my Affinity foils, and I spent way too much money on my deck. But think about that. You, like, that's how deep of a love this format inspires in people once they get um, enfranchised with it. Like, well, and some people are like, why would you pimp out your popper deck? And I'm like, because I, it's still dirt cheap, A. <laughs> yeah. And B, it's fun. Like, if you want to play a pimp deck, like, you like, oh, I don't know how I'll ever afford Judge Force of Wills. You know, <laughs> play, play popper. Foil well, counterspells are like, the Judge Foil counterspells are like 25 bucks. And that's the most expensive one, so... Yeah, like, I definitely think, you know, the combination of selling it on its power level, selling it on the budget aspect, and also, you know, having decks available for people, those three things are some of the most important steps to getting Popper to take off in your area. That, and having a good relationship with a local game store who's willing to give this a chance. And I feel like a lot, so now that you can sanction anything, a lot of game stores say if you... Give enough people, we will sanction it. And, you know, I think a lot of people don't know this either. You only need six people to sanction an event. Yep. You don't need eight. You need yeah. six. Um, but definitely, you know, if you have other questions about this, don't be afraid to contact us and reach out. Because we have a robust popper scene. We fired, like, a, there was one week we fired a 24-person popper f and yeah, man, and it's it is great. You know, the, it's, it is some work, but the the benefits you reap are astounding. And there are some people who um, I don't think would have come to the store otherwise. Like a lot of people there, I've never seen except to play popper. And then, but we also have a share of people who you know play modern and on Fridays and have seen us playing, and they're like, "Oh, I want to try a popper now too." You know? Yeah, uh, there have actually been several nights where popper has fired with more people than modern had. Yeah, like, and we're handling. We're very, very fortunate that we have such a good popper scene. But, you know, it can be yours, too, with a little bit of work. Yeah. And, you know, it doesn't have to be an FNM. It could be in the middle of the week. Yeah. Don't yeah. don't get hang up, hung up on the details. Figure out a time where people can come and want to play this format. And they will. Like, it's kind of out of the way for me to get to this game store. Like, Pat, Pat's is a little bit of a hike for me. And I do have a game store right across the street from me. I don't ever go to F&M there because there's no popper available. And I think, you know... It's not tied at all to the <clears throat> PAX situation. Don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but definitely, like, people will come to play this format if you just get them to give it a chance. And, you know, I think one of the, one of the things that we did that was successful, um, if you just can't scrape together the people for an F&M... Mike has run a league as well, and you prize, yes. if you prize that yourself, uh, I, I want to foil ponder for my troubles, just so everyone yeah. knows. Uh, you can organize a league, and that might also incentivize people to, to play the format. So, so for the with respect to the league, that was actually organized, again, with Pats, and oh, basically, um, well, they were where we got our prize support. Oh, okay, okay. So, so what we did was we had a $6 entry fee. So, ten people, we styled it after the, um, the Vintage Super League, where mm-hmm. it's a round robin. So, nine weeks, you play each player in the league once. And then we cut to top four. We, did, we set up ours up so that every three weeks, you got to make alterations to your deck. Either swapping a completely new one, or just tooling it a little bit. Lists were public knowledge. Um, and graciously, Pat's Games, you know, since they wanted to support this, and, you know, a lot of people are going to buy singles there, when we showed up with 60 bucks worth of entry fees, they got a little lenient with the actual cost of singles, you know, and, again, it's to support the community. Right. And that that's super, super nice of them, and they really didn't need to do that. Like, I would have played in the first league, even if there was, like, just... Cash payouts. Yeah. But that, but you don't need a game store to organize that either. You could work, and I mean, that sounds like a daunting task. You can organize your own league. You don't need a store to sanction it. A hundred percent. So there's a, a bunch of ways to organize a league. I really like the round robin. I really like it because it means you're playing against a variety of opponents, you know. And if ten people is too much to get together, get together six. Yeah. Like, like, like you don't have to do anything... 
Like, yeah, just get, you need six people. That's it. Six people to play pop. And I, we, we use um, Challenge. It's yeah. Challenge with an O in it. It's great. It's a tournament tracking software. It lets you just enter names, and it'll automatically put up pairings. You know, you can go in when people report, you know, put their scores in there, how well they finish, and it automatically calculates stuff for you. Then, you know, if you've got enough people, you can do a cut to top four, do a playoff that way, or, you know, just do whatever. That. Like, there's no wrong way to do this as long as you're getting people to play this format and having a good time. Yes. Like... I definitely feel like I've played other formats. I used to play Standard when I was younger. You know, I play Legacy every now and then. I own a couple of EDH decks and play with my casual friends. I own multiple cubes at this point, which, you know, I'm already just, like, stressing out thinking about how much I've spent on those damn things. Popper, consistently, is the one format where I'm like, I'm going to go in, I'm going to have a good time. I can go... 0 and 4, I will still have a better time with this than I would with standard. And the thing is, I think people also one of the one of the good things is, um, you know, there's no this this is the thing that the reason I got out of modern. There was Eldrazi and like Splinter Twin. We're just I hated losing to them because the decks are. What am I trying to say? The, 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 what I'm trying to say is the strategies in in Popper are not nearly as streamlined as the strategies in modern, and that's the main reason I stopped playing modern and started playing a lot more popper it's because I was tired of losing these extremely linear strategies and it's basically like do you have your sideboard card in the top 12 cards of your deck yeah yes or no and that's just so that's just not fun magic to me I think vintage is more fun than that modern is modern sort of has a black mark for me now um it's just it's just not fun to me anymore yeah I I definitely think that popper has a lot of strength as a format I don't think I ever want to see it as you know, maybe a Watsy sanctioned format because I don't want it being meddled with. Now that's, like that's how a whole is. that's a whole thing, right? Because we won't like I don't think Popper should be like a GP format, definitely not a Pro Tour format. But I would like to see some cohesion between the Popper ban list and the, the like an official paper Popper ban list. Yes, I I would love if they acknowledged it as a paper format. And actually, this week Matt Tabak commented in a Reddit thread saying that they have no intention of doing that. Oh, okay. Well, at least we know. Yeah, at least we know. Um, Carry on, everyone. Also, you know, while I don't want it ever to be a Pro Tour format, I would absolutely love to watch some of the pros play Popper. Like, I've seen some of LSV's streams where he's played, he played Familiars a couple times, Mm -hmm. and it was really fun to watch, you know, Magic Pros who I've watched for a while play decks that I know inside and out. I thought that was pretty cool. Um... But definitely, like, try and get people involved. Get Popper played in your area. And yeah. it's just helpful. Something we've, we've talked about, too, um, SCG game night and the TCG player, whatever nights, don't care what format you play. Yes. They just provide $10. You get all the price. You get all this, like, neat price stuff. And I'm not, like, shilling out these companies. I've never used them before. But you can gussy up a Popper tournament pretty darn well. And, you know, you can give it all the trappings of, like, official format. Because it is on Moto, but I'm saying, like, you can show to people that this format has just as much legitimacy as the other formats, the other constructed formats. It's it's easy to do. Yeah. All right, well, I think we're getting pretty close on time here. Yeah. Um, Remember to subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook. Uh, We're also on iTunes, and if you subscribe there, it would be great if you leave us an iTunes review. It really helps us out. Um, if you have a discussion topic or a deck list that you want featured on the show, you can use either the contact form on our website or email us directly at colorcommentary at gmail.com. And we might even feature you on Rebrew. Yes, we are, we are seriously going to try and ramp up video production on other content. So we're not just a podcast. We're trying to, you know, be a little bit more legitimate. Yeah. I'm Michael Petchek. And I'm Adrian Warzalis. Signing off for Color Commentary. Color Commentary.